Hey there gang, I've got a lovely Taylor guitar here on the bench today. This is from 1999. It is a 414CE. And to be honest, I'm not really feeling it. I think we should work on something else, like this one from 2007, which is also a 414CE. Hmm. I've mentioned this before, right? How every once in a while, it's like the stars align, and then a bunch of different people unrelated to each other and unplanned will show up with the same instrument and then it becomes ukulele month or 12 string December and it seems to be Taylor time here at Woodford Instruments this week because this is the third cutaway Taylor I've dealt with in the past five days. This older one was in for a setup nothing too out of the ordinary um, I kinda shy away from doing straight setup videos to be honest because they can get a bit monotonous I imagine for you to view and also for me to produce um, there's really only so many times I want to film and edit the exact same sequence of events and say the same things over and over again. And there are other channels you can go and watch that all the time. So, you know, I do try to keep this stuff novel, as much for my benefit as yours. A couple of interesting differences on these two guitars made about seven or eight years apart. You can see at some point they added a center seam back graft to support the glue joint in the center of the back. And they also seem to have moved the bridge pin holes backwards by about a millimeter and a half or so on the new model. Let's see if I can get you in here. So there's a crack that runs along the underside of the fingerboard here on the base side and up into the neck shaft. Now it's really tight, but there is some slight height discrepancy between the two surfaces. Um, this is one of the necks that doesn't have the finger joint type splice between the headstock and the neck. It's got a scarf joint. And there's also this kind of volute looking tag kind of thing that they cut out on the CNC. So it fits together pretty well. The forces got directed upwards in this case. Um, it's not in danger of gaping open or falling off or anything. It's really tight. So I think it was an instantaneous thing where for a moment it opened up and then immediately snapped shut again with the force of an alligator's jaws. It's not going to be easy to get glue really deep in here, but we should try just to lock the two parts together. You know, for the long haul, it's better for the guitar. Now, this guitar originally had the Taylor Expression pickup system in it, and the owners, to be honest, didn't really care for it very much. Um, they much prefer the LR Bags Anthem, sonically. So we're going to go ahead and do a swap. The thing is, of course, anytime you try and remove one of these integrated preamp pickups, you often end up with a bunch of holes in the side of your guitar. What do you think? Do these count as decorative sound ports? Maybe not so much. So the goal is to find a cost-effective way to reduce their visual intrusiveness. We're not going to try and make them disappear, just dress them up a bit if we can. Of course, one of the other parts of the Taylor system here is this cute little battery tray that goes into the end block here, which is kind of nice. Um, the LR Bags Anthem usually has just a regular battery bag, and we Velcro that to either the neck block or somewhere up against the side of the guitar in the upper bout. So I'm going to see if I can do some fancy wiring and relocate that battery down here to this end of the guitar and we can maintain the usefulness of this little thing here. Something else to note here as I'm taking the strings off is that this tuner, the D string, seems to be missing the little nylon washer that goes between the head and the shaft here. Now, it still functions without that, but it's kind of important. Usually there's a small tension ring of some kind, like a wave washer, and the nylon acts as a sort of compressible thing. Um, when we tighten up the head against the shaft using the screw, uh, you want to distribute that force, otherwise it tends to rock back and forth, and it's not very secure, and that little bit of play gets amplified, you end up with kind of loose tuning, and eventually this whole thing just fails to function. So we're going to see if we can replace it. I don't think I have an exact match, but I've got this old Grover here in the spares pile, and we'll see if we can make that work. Don't lose that little guy. Nice. It's probably not a perfect fit, but it'll work. Oh yeah, much better. 
just using my little right angle measuring rod here to figure out the thickness of the sides in this area. The plugs I'm going to create will not be the same thickness. They'll be slightly proud of the surface by maybe a sixteenth of an inch or so. Um, I wouldn't want to try and match them up perfectly. That would be a very big operation and kind of expensive. The other thing is these holes are a weird diameter, like 427 thousandths, which is like 10.8 millimeters. So you're never going to find a plug cutter that will cut an accurate hole for this. Like unless you wanted to create a CNC program and cut them out with a router on a CNC, not going to happen. So um, the options would be to drill this out to 7 sixteenths or half an inch, or just use them as they are and create plugs that will fit in there reasonably well from the inside. To make the plugs I'll mark and cut out some small squares of material. It's about five millimeters thick. I intend to turn these on my little lathe so I will glue those in place onto a face plate on which I have some masking tape. It's not a super secure bond but it's strong enough for what I'm about to do. Do some roughing cuts. This cut will look scary if you have some spindle turning experience. Don't worry, I know what I'm doing. Check and measure. As we get close, I'll switch to a spear point uh, tool, which I'm using as a very delicate scraper. I'll round off the corner using a file. And then sand it. I used to use this lathe I actually had a small carrier set up designed so that I could um, replicate Baroque guitar tuning pegs. For the inside portion of the plug, uh, which is basically a big cleat, I'll cut off some larger material, bevel the inside corners a little bit. And I'll glue on the little buttons. Try to get those centered. Clamp them in place with my little baby spring clamps. Let those dry. A quick coat of satin lacquer. And then I'll glue those in place using magnets. You can see I've got the headstock. I've taken the tuners off and I've put it in my vise here. This has got cork padded um, plywood jaws in there. So you know it's not going to damage the headstock. And I'm trying to get enough leverage that I can separate the neck from the fingerboard in that area. And I can get a little bit of movement, but it's not big enough that I could get a syringe in there with standard woodworking glue. Um, it's interesting, of course, this crack here, the effects of string tension will actually close it rather than open it up. So, you know, it's going to be well supported. I think we're going to use thin super glue. And... Uh, you know, rely on capillary action to get that in there as far as we can. There are people who like to discuss my choice of super glue, just old fashioned crazy glue in the tiny little containers you can buy at the hardware store. And it's not that I think it's superior to like hot stuff as the other brand I use. It's just that um, for whatever reason I find that the hot stuff um, containers tend to cake over really quickly and I'm constantly trying to clean them out and it gets kind of frustrating. So the nice thing about these is they don't tend to clog up as much and they're a small quantity so it's always fresh. I've thrown out an awful lot of larger bottles of super glue over the years. So we're just going to get that down in the crack. Okay, we should figure out the power supply here. They give you just enough cord to reach around in the upper bout, so we're going to have to do some surgery to that to make it long enough to reach the end block. And that connects using this little clippy device here. I wonder why they didn't use the standard 3mm jack. Maybe because there's already two on there, they don't want to confuse you. Um, but yeah, we should make sure we get the positives and the negatives in the right place. You got a piece of this spare two conductor cord from this old power pack which should do nicely. I'll use the supplied battery connector. I'll cut it off, leaving enough that I can splice on the required length. The most important thing is to remember to put on the shrink tubing before you go ahead and solder those wires together. It's hard to do it afterwards. I'm drilling a hole for the undersaddle pickup. 
They suggest doing this at a slight angle so the pickup ribbon doesn't have to bend hard at a right angle to get into the slot. There we go. Goes all the way through. That's important. And on the other side, uh, the slight clearance hole so that the pickup can extend past the end of the saddle slot. I'll do a dry run for the placement of the microphone. To do that, I sight down through the center two bridge pin holes here, and with a light directly above, I can easily see the circular part of the pickup that needs to be centered. I can find out the right position, and I'll shift it forward about a half inch, and that will give me adequate clearance in front of the holes for the ball ends of the strings, and get me pretty much perfectly centered on uh, the saddle slot here. And before I put any pressure on that, I'll just, just barely let the adhesive stick onto the bridge plate. I can remove my hand, get in there with a mirror, make sure it's in the right spot, and then go back in and then put the pressure on so it sticks. Pretty good. It's good and centered. The LR bag's jacks are actually just a little bit too wide for the standard Taylor hole, so I have to ream those out a little bit so that it can go through. I need to get rid of the rear of the battery box housing. So I'll drill and carve that away. Not only to get the wire through there, but also because of this different connector I'm using, the battery ends up being slightly too long and it would bottom out, preventing the uh, proper closure of the cover plate. It's time to install the control module using that sticky foam tape. I'll scrape the super glue squeeze out area flush and then I'll sand and polish the area of the repair. With the addition of the under saddle pickup, I need to reduce the height of the saddle slightly as well to account for that. So I'll mark it out. And this stuff is soft enough that I can use a hand plane to sort of rough off most of the material and I'll get at it with a sanding block. Okay, I've got those plugs in there. I think they look all right. And the anthem is installed. I managed to get all the wires to behave. That's always a fun part of the process, working with those tiny little fold-over clips and making sure nothing's flopping around in there. For the guitar repair nerds, we can talk about something and maybe we can share some information. For these recent tailors, I'm noticing a pattern. I've had one that was 20 years old, one that was 16, and then this one here is 13. And they seem to be on course for a neck reset somewhere between 15 and 20 years of age. At about 15, you start to run out of saddle height. Now this is an acceptable amount of exposure here. The saddle is tall enough. Um, but this player likes a medium-high action. If you were someone who needed a really low string height, you probably couldn't do it on this guitar without some surgery. So the neck block is tipping forward, and the necks are coming up at a rate that is faster than I expect to see on a comparable Martin-style guitar. For Martins, in my experience, it's usually 25 to 30 years before the reset is needed, um, depending on action preference and what you can get used to playing. So this is a shorter timeline. The nice thing, of course, is that with these bolt-ons, it's not as big a job, but it still requires painstaking attention to detail to do it right. So there is a bit of a trade-off here. Um, I'll plug this thing in. Uh, the Anthem is a good sounding pickup, but at the end of the day, it still sounds like a pickup. I was listening the other night to some live acoustic recordings from the 60s, uh, folky stuff, um, Simon and Garfunkel, that kind of thing. And it's startling how good an acoustic guitar sounds on stage if you can put a mic in front of it. It's not a subtle difference. Pickups sound like pickups. Anyway, my amp is not going to give you the best impression of what this thing can do, but it will at least prove that it works. <laughs> Thank you.